Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dan Snow's History. I've got a very special episode of the podcast. As I get older, like everybody else, getting more into family history. As I see myself aging, I realise that this is a continuum, folks. I'm not just 21 forever. This is actually a process by which we get old, have kids, they get old, and the whole parade continues. Therefore, I'm getting kind of interested in who came before. So when Find My Past approached me and asked if I wanted to do a kind of who do you think you are, I said yes. I was super excited, as we all do. I've got a weird and wonderful family history. I've got paupers and prime ministers. I've got absolute scoundrels. I've got slave traders, war criminals, nabobs. I've got some pretty wonderful people as well. And so I was absolutely thrilled to have this conversation with Mick O'Cleland. He works at Find My Past, and I was just a huge privilege. He took me through generations of my family's history. He found documents, pictures, newspaper articles that I'd never seen before and didn't know existed. It was very spoiling, and it was a huge treat. I hope you find it of some interest, and I hope it inspires you to go on this journey as well, because the internet has done many things for us, folks. But one thing it's enables us to do is go on like a proper journey through our past, a, a fascinating journey in which you can look at, for example, census records, you can trace your family tree way back. Just do it. It's awesome. It's good fun. So this is a very special episode of Dan Snow's History Hit, in which I learn all about my own past. Hope you enjoy. Miko, thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's been a really exciting experience to root through your family tree and find some exciting stories to talk about. Well, the good news is that everyone's got an exciting family tree, right? Because humans are completely extraordinary. And you go back far enough, we're all related to some seriously famous and interesting people. Oh, definitely. I know the old saying that he who hasn't got names and beggars in their family tree as begotten by a flash of lightning. And I'm going to walk through a few examples of some of your ancestors and try and tell some of those stories. And I'm fairly sure some of this is going to be new to you. And I'm using documents from archives and libraries around the world to do it. But the thing that takes this outside of the realm of being something for expert historians and into the world of anyone who has an interest in where they come from is a website like Find My Past. It's one of the leading family history websites, and there are records there that you won't find anywhere else. We've been scanning and digitizing these billions of records, and all of these are things that your ancestors might appear in, and they've been indexed, so they can be searched any time of the day or night, as this can be pretty addictive, just at the touch of a button. You can still go to archives, as lots of historians do, and you can go through page by page, but anyone can go to buymypast.co.uk and they can do exactly the same thing that I'm doing now. They can look at records that we're going to talk about and they can do this whole process themselves. They can look at their own family and they can tell their own stories. Well, listen, Mika, I would love to jump in. I know a little bit about my family, although I sometimes think when you love history, you're not that focused on your family history because you find it as interesting to study Mary Wollstonecraft or Sir Francis Drake as someone you happen to be related to. But as I get older, like everybody, I'm kind of more and more fascinated now. Who did you go back to first? What line did you choose? I think for anyone with an interest in history, as you say, there are celebrities and people that we are really interested in learning about their lives. But knowing what your family was doing during all these pivotal moments in history gives you this sense of deeper connection to the past and an appreciation for what our ancestors might have lived through at the same sort of point of these celebrities. And it can also explain a bit sometimes about who you are today at the same time. And when it comes to your family tree, in a lot of ways, you're the perfect illustration of why family history is so captivating. You've got that bill of noble blood, as many of us do, even if we're not aware of it. And you've got a lot of ancestors that made headlines and anyone listening will know who they are the second they're named. But generally, we've got two parents, four grandparents, eight, 16, and so on, until we get back centuries. And the number of people that contribute to making us who we are starts to number in the millions. Every single one of them, they've made decisions that brought you where you are today. You're the sum of every choice, every word said, every event. And you've got working class ancestors. You've got heroes. You've got black sheep. So does everyone. Family history is about telling those stories. And we can do that now in a way that our ancestors could only have dreamed of with the sort of tools we have at our disposal, like from my past. And as we wander through this family tree, and I will start with our first one very shortly and give you that who do you think you are style experience. I just wanted to wonder how you would describe your own heritage. Well, I'd describe my heritage as very, very mixed. I've got a mum born in Wales to Welsh and Scottish parents although her Welsh mother was born in Bangalore, India. <laughs> I've got a dad born in Dublin to Anglo-Irish parents. So it's very, very mixed. 
you've mentioned it there, but I know that some of my ancestors were grand. You know, they were members of the aristocracy, so they got good family trees for them. But then others, they were just working class fishermen, particularly in the Mull of Kintyre or farmers in Pembrokeshire. So, so yeah, I'd say a really wonderful mix. I think so as well. And I think as we walk backwards through some of the more recent relatives and work towards deeper history, we might be able to spot some of the strands of what makes Dan Snow, Dan Snow in all the stories that these people left behind. And I think we're going to start with your great grandfather, Sir Thomas Doyley Snow. What can you tell me about him? Well, speaking of what makes Dan Snow, Dan Snow, he was very tall. He had receding hair and a huge nose. So uh, that is definitely what makes Dan Snow, Dan Snow. But no, General Thomas Snow, I do know a bit about him because I've made a few programs about him now over the years of the BBC. He was a commanding officer on the first day of the Somme. He was a general on the Somme. So he's a member of one of the most reviled groups probably in British history. Young officer in the Zulu War, you know, fascinating 19th, early 20th century career and was kicked out from the Western Front basically by being too old after the Battle of Cambrai. But what did you find out about him? He commanded the 4th Infantry Division from 1911 to 1914, 7th Corps for the rest of his wartime service. And you're right, he was at some of these really pivotal military moments of the First World War. And to be in a position of command during the Battle of the Somme must have been an incredibly difficult thing to be a part of. And I think a lot of people listening will have had their lives touched by his decisions and actions. But We get a vision of the British officer class, particularly in the First World War, through drama like 1917 or even comedy like Blackadder Goes Forth. They're sort of an uncaring sort with an almost callous disregard for human life. But when we start to step out of the history books and into the world of genealogy, we start to learn about what life was like for those people. And we can see the day-to-day moments that give you more of an idea of who someone was and round out that picture of your great-grandfather, not just as a history book name, And we see that he wasn't removed from his troops in the way you might imagine. He made steps to improve their lives. His division was the first to introduce divisional baths. It was the first to start a band and the first to make its own performance troupe, which they called the Follies. And he wasn't miles away behind a desk when all this heroism was taking place. He was there. And we can see with records like this one, which I found in Farmer Pass Military Collection, if you can take a look at that and see if you can see your great grandfather's name there and tell me what you're looking at. So yeah, I've got the World War I medical record here, which is really interesting. I didn't know this record existed. This is good to see. I'm just pulling it up here. Okay, so what have we got? He's been highlighted, quite luckily, with a red asterisk. Oh, that's weird. That wasn't you guys, it was someone else. That's That's from the original record. Oh, very good. So at some point in history, someone was going through these and uh, making notes, and they seem to have made a note of your great-grandfather. Pelvis. Ah, yeah. Some pelvic injury, didn't he, on the retreat from Mons, that looks like, in 1914, at the beginning of the war. In October 1914, he's got something going on with his... Is that his pelvis? What's that mean? Yes. So he was at the Battle of the Marne in 1914, and he was one of the last generals in Britain who commanded from horseback. He fractured his pelvis when his horse fell and rolled onto him and then got phlebitis from the same injury. And this is something he needed treatment for repeatedly during the war. And you might have some story about his injury because he spent the rest of his remaining life in a wheelchair and at least partially disabled. But looking at these records, we can see all of the treatments that he had over the course of the war as he continued to serve as a commanding officer whilst also being in and out of hospital, definitely in some considerable pain as he went through. That's amazing. Weirdly, one of the few pictures I have in my family is him in the 1930s, my dad, little baby, sitting on his lap, and he's in a wheelchair there. And there's this family story that he begs Kitchener, he says, I'm too old, I don't want to go back, I can't command a division in France and Belgium. And Kitchener said, we haven't got enough general officers, you've got to get over there, the army's expanding exponentially. And so that goes with the family story that he was desperate not to serve because he didn't think he was well enough. And I can imagine trying to plan the Battle of Somme whilst in serious pain and going back for treatment all the time. Obviously, that's not ideal. It's incredible to see that and to learn a bit more again about those pains that he suffered. But I wanted to focus a little bit on the happy moments as well while we rounded things off. His family appear almost as often as he does in lots of newspapers of the era. It's the dawn of the age of celebrity, really. So there's a really interesting article that we found from The Sketch in 1914 
called Wives of the Generals of the War with a fascinating, wonderful picture of your great grandmother and a little description of her. Let me open that now. So this is back in the day when the generals and their wives passed for celebrities. There you go. It's exciting that people at home not only wanted to hear about what the generals were doing, but they wanted to see the families of these generals and perhaps maybe to personify them and to make them a little more human so that we felt a little more attached to those people who were away fighting at the front. But I then wanted to look at that marriage between your great-grandparents to learn a lot more because the marriage, of course, is one of the biggest events in anyone's life. And that's got a really big impact both in our family story and when it comes to looking at documents. If we so, can take a look at the original marriage record between your great-grandparents, which Farmer Pass scanned and made searchable online for the first time, it's full colour and we see every ink mark, every heavy and light slip of a pen. The record gives the age of those married, the date of marriage, occupation of the groom, where both parties lived, father's names and occupations, where they married, denomination, all filled in by the officiant. But I want to draw your attention to the bottom of the page, and we see that we're looking at something much more special. This is where things really start to get exciting. We can okay. see the signatures of the bride and groom, and there's something really powerful about seeing something signed by your ancestor's own hand. That's amazing. He was 38, and she was 27. Wow. <laughs> okay, and you can so... almost trace the path of the ink with your finger and just be that little bit closer to them in one of those really big moments in their lives. Yeah, that is amazing. But that's not all, just beneath the surface. A little bit more research, we can see the marriage really was a family affair. Do you recognize okay. any of the other names on that? Oh, here we go. Hang on a sec. So they're getting married in Aldershot. Uh, there's mum and dad's name. Uh, his dad was a clerk in holy orders. Hang on. This marriage was solemnified. Married in the presence of, they got witnesses there, Hubert Hamilton, uh, Morris Snow something coke so these are what they're witnesses they're friends are they you've got witnesses so talbot coke is your great great grandfather so we uh -huh. have his signature as well and you can see the name henry bowles sign there as the efficient and that's the cousin of your great grandfather really you got married by his cousin that must have been so nice <laughs> well when you look at your great great grandfather's signature as well as a witness you can see the echoes again of someone who was born right at the start of the reign of queen victoria again in their own hand that is very very special indeed that's so cool well thank you very much you guys did that's very kind of you to digitize that one that's great the official records they're sort of the backbone of family history and farmer pass got this really big collection of those kinds of records but when we start turning to other records that we've got access to, we can show much more than government documents ever could. So the turn of the century, St. James Gazette had their own report on the wedding. And they noted that the bride wore a dress of ivory satin with court train of brocade. The bridesmaids were Miss Dorothy Coke, sister of the bride, Miss Kitty Snow, sister of the bridegroom, Miss May E. Glynn and Miss Minnie McAdam, cousins of the bride. After the reception, which was held at the officer's clubhouse, Captain and Mrs. Snow left for the Riviera where the honeymoon will be spent. That is cool. Fashionable marriage. <laughs> wow. Well, it gets better as well. So in another newspaper, we see a few of the more famous attendants. The Duke and Duchess of Connaught attended. That's Queen Victoria's last surviving son. Wow. To Governor General of Canada. And we see a much more vivid description of that wedding ceremony. And we even get a list of gifts given by the guests. I don't know if you've got too many family heirlooms on that side around, but this might well tell you where they came from. The Duke gave a turquoise and diamond shamrock brooch. Father of the Bride gave a pony dog cart and harness. Others gave silver bowls, Venetian glass finger bowls, copies of Shakespeare and Tennyson, table lamps, fans. The list is really exhaustive. We even see an armchair, a fish slice, and even a Koran stand. Well, I'll tell you something, buddy. None of that is still in Team Snow's hands. So I'm going to have to have a chat with some uncles and cousins and aunts. Amazing. It might be worth tracking that down. <laughs> yeah. Well, you might think that this description is unique, but it's not at all. In partnership with the British Library, we've been scanning and building a collection of tens of millions of pages of newspapers, and they go back from the 1700s all the way to the modern day, and they're all searchable on Find My Past and the sister website, the British Newspaper Archive. And there's every chance that anyone listening can find relatives in here, not only at those momentous occasions, but all the way through their life. And it's not uncommon to even find photographs of the wedding party and the event itself. Wow, that is very, very cool indeed. I could play degrees of separation. So I know that my great-grandfather met the son of Queen Victoria. So that's me in four jumps back to Queen Victoria. I'm very excited. 
I really like with just that little bit more detail, we can peer into the lives of our ancestors. And I hope you'll forgive the pun, but speaking of peers, I wanted to step back a generation and move to your mother's side of the family, to your great-great-grandfather, who's a man who needs almost no introduction, David Lloyd George. Yeah, so he's the first prime minister from a working-class background in British history, only Welsh speaker ever to become prime minister. And it was obviously a very controversial political figure. There was some corruption. His dealings with women were very questionable, certainly by today's standards, and I think probably by their standards at the time. And so, yeah, it's a very fascinating, quite a divisive figure. I wanted to, again, step away from the history books, I think, because I know that most people are probably going to already have a fairly solid view of the man, whether it's positive or negative. And we all know who he is, and we could spend the rest of the episode exploring this in detail. But I wanted to use genealogy again to ask not just what he did in his lifetime, but who he was. So I'm going to use the census to give a better illustration of his upbringing. And this is a document taken every 10 years. You might be familiar with it from filling out your own in the past, but it provides a real snapshot of life. It gives you this frozen moment in time that describes what your ancestors were doing, where they were born, what they did for a living, and who their family was. So when we look at the census taken in 1881, we see the beginnings of David Lloyd George. We see he was 18, living with his uncle, his widowed mother, and his two siblings, and taking his first steps in his profession at the solicitor's clerk. Yeah, this is really interesting. I've been to the cottage where they lived, and his uncle was a cobbler. So let's see if my family mythology is kind of correct. Let's see in the census. Okay. David Lloyd George, nephew. That's right. Elizabeth was his mum, I think. Yeah, and then William's his brother. William George. Solicitor and articled clerk. So you might think at this point in history, you didn't really have an inkling of what might come later, but you can't get a better primary source than his very own diary which I found a copy of the entry for a particular day, 12th of November, 1881. So that's the same year that this census was taken, and nine years before he even became an MP. And I think it would be more poignant than, rather than me reading it aloud, that you get the chance to repeat the words of your own great-great-grandfather. Okay, here we go. Went to Houses of Parliament. This is amazing. This is a young Welsh boy speaking Welsh, going to London for the first time. Amazing. Went to Houses of Parliament, very much disappointed with them. Grand buildings outside, but inside they're crabbed, small and suffocating, especially the House of Commons. I will not say, but I eyed the Assembly in a similar spirit to that which William the Conqueror eyed England on his visit to Edward the Confessor as the region of his future domain. Oh, vanity. At Westminster Abbey, contemplated the monuments of departed genius, in the evening, went with uncle to Madame Tussauds. <laughs> that is just brilliant. How does that feel, sort of stepping into the shoes of someone who's a part of you and looking out onto the world almost through their eyes for a moment? Yeah, I think that's really strange. It's particularly odd for me because that's exactly the kind of insane thing I'd have written when I was that age. But in his case, he actually followed through and it did become his domain. Uh, in my case, certainly hasn't. But he's got a sense of history. He talks about Edward the Confessor and William the Conqueror. He knows from an early age that he wants to go there and dominate Parliament. Incredible arrogance of youth. And then he contemplating the monuments to part of genius in Westminster Abbey, which I spend more of my time doing. So that's pretty weird. He's my great-great-grandpa, but there's definitely some powerful parallels. I think he might have had those grand ambitions even then. I think you're yeah. right. And from words like that, and using the information we find in the census that we've already revealed, we can go back and forward through time, 10 years with every census, and we can see his progress in 1911. And he's definitely a little bit grander now. If you take a look at that census, we can see more details in this one. 1911 is the latest one that we have access to. Censuses are so detailed, they're held back for 100 years to protect the privacy of those involved. The 1921 census is almost due to be released. Uh, Farmer Past is going to be the only place you'll be able to look at that when it does come. But you can see some things here that make this quite exciting. Unlike yeah, earlier censuses, the records preserved here are the original forms filled in by the head of the household. So it's their description of their world. It's how they see the world. It's their handwriting. It's their signature. Sometimes you'll see moments of bravery, like a suffragette declaring that if they can't vote, they shouldn't be in the census. Sometimes you'll find heartwarming moments, like a family who decides to add their pet cat or dog as a member of the family in the census. And you'll see for the first time a list of the number of children born to each married couple together with the number of children still living, which is something quite poignant in an era of high infant mortality. Yeah, well, we've got David Lloyd George here, head of the house. 
Uh, he is 48. Margaret, his wife, my great great grandmother. They got Richard Lloyd George, his son. Megan, his daughter, Megan Lloyd George. And then John Rowland, who's his private secretary. And then we got three other members of staff. Very Welsh, Sarah Jones, Annie Evans, and I can't read that other name, but something Jones as well, all servants. They obviously brought servants from North Wales. I don't want to mess about these English people. He spoke Welsh as his first language, as you said. Yeah. And when we look at those places of birth, it might give you a clue to the language that was spoken oh, at home. Okay, yes, exactly. Cricketh, Cricketh, Cricketh. And then the, the servants came from Cricketh, Clantestormwy, and Blynau, or I think Carnarfon, actually. And then he lists himself as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Isn't that amazing? And then his son, interestingly, is a civil engineer, Richard. I think he ended up joining the Royal Engineers in the war, so that definitely makes sense. Wow. What a thing to see. That's very special. Thank you very much. Oh, we can spend a long time walking through David's life, especially at the moment that he's on the verge of becoming Prime Minister, and that's when a lot of documents start to appear. But I wanted to move back again a few generations and to your father's side, to India. Do you know much about your connections here? No, I don't. The rumour that one of my ancestors was a kind of nabob, one of those people who went to India and, and made lots of money, but I don't know much about them at all. So that's pretty much exactly what we're going to focus on. Your three times great-grandfather, John Hadley de Oily. Does that name ring a bell and connect to that story at all? Yeah, John Hadley de Oily does, because strangely, I live in New Forest now, and I think he built a house near where I've ended up, no connection at all, but where I ended up moving. And so I often drive past it and think, that's amazing. Did my ancestor build that house? Yeah, even though India is thousands of miles away, a lot of records were sent back regularly by ship to the India office in London and Copies of those original records are only available online on Farm My Pass. So because of that, you can now look at them, whether you're in London or India or anywhere else. But these documents help us to get a better understanding of your ancestor again and who they are. And I wanted to show you one of the most personal documents we can get, a will. It's written in his own hands, and you can see that he asked for his funeral to be as moderate as decency will admit. And he lists his sons, and uh, together with your ancestor, his daughter, Maynard. And these documents can be pages and pages long. You'll see a lot of someone's life boiled down. Wills, at this point in history, weren't written as a matter of course as they are today. They're written when someone's either about to embark on a dangerous journey or if they fell ill and death was possible. And it gives you an idea of someone's thoughts in what could be their final days. And they definitely have a fair amount of money as well at this point. £8,000, which was nothing to be sniffed at at that time. He violated one of the golden rules of business, and he went into business with members of his wife's family. So he oh. lost a great deal of it and had to go back to India. So he spent some time, as you say, in England, and he rebuilt his fortune in India after losing it once already. And uh, this is the moment of him, I guess, back on top, just at the point before his death. It's quite a thing to see someone's will, isn't it? I had no idea this existed. Wow. It's exciting when we can compare that to the probate document, which is the next document along. And this is the supporting document where the executor tries to pay the bills of the estate and give out the inheritance. And that gives us some of the personality as well of your ancestors. So we can see that John had outstanding bills for books that he'd ordered to be bound and two outstanding bills for quite expensive shoes. Oh, a taste for nice shoes is not something I've inherited, but that is very good to see. I'm looking at that one now. And when we turn again to newspapers, we can echo that narrative and further it along. And we can see an Indian newspaper of the period, the Madras Courier of 1818. They publish a death notice that adds more of a picture of who John was. And if you'd like to read aloud this very heartfelt description for us. Okay, on Monday, the fifth instance, Sir John Hadley Doyley of Shottisham in the county of Norfolk. I had no idea he was from there. Baronet Salt Agent of the 24 Pagunas, age 64. He made good old age, sincerely and deservedly regretted. In life, he was highly distinguished for the integrity and benevolence of his heart, the warmth and steadiness of his affections, and the undeviating rectitude and urbanity of his character. That's good. These estimable qualities were consistently manifested in the habitual discharge of every moral and social duty. The memory of his virtues was a father and a friend, and all the domestic relations of life will long be cherished 
by those who had the best opportunity of appreciating them. He was a devout and sincere Christian, tranquility, resigned to the will of providence and inspired with the most cheerful, unaffected piety. He represented Ipswich, his native place in two parliaments. He was remarkable for the independence of his principles and through his life he was the faithful and devoted friend of Mr. Hastings. Oh, Warren Hastings, wow. So there you go. That's amazing. I didn't know he was an MP as well. He's got it all going on. There are family stories and we can bring in documents to add some truth to those tales or disprove them in some cases. And the core records of the birth, marriage and death and things like that give us cold, hard facts. But when we take those and we apply them to a family history search with a little bit of digging, and this isn't something that you need anything more than your own curiosity. Anyone can do this at home, something like Farm My Past. We started to turn the names written down on paper back into living, breathing people. One of my favorite proverbs is a Russian one. You live as long as you remembered. And it feels like we're bringing these people back from the mists of time and we're giving them a bit of another chance to pass that story on to the present. I completely agree. Thank you very much for that. Right, come on, who's next? We've got time for one more, have we? So we really could keep walking through and showing thousands of these records and stories, but I wanted to round things off with something of a question. Do you think you inherited your love of history? Uh, Well, not genetically, I guess, but I think in our family, it's a tradition that we all love telling stories about the past, my aunt, my grandma, everybody. So yeah, possibly. Why? Who have you found? Well, who would you guess or say was the first historian in your family? I have no idea, buddy. I have no idea stretching back into the distant past. Well, we stepped in the course of this research all the way back to the Tudor era. And it's not impossible to trace a family back for half a millennia or more when you've got access to documents like these. And I found something here that might really inspire you. The traits that we see in ourselves, they can stem through genetics and they can come from the lessons we teach to our children. And there's no real telling how far that curiosity has been passed down. So I'm going to introduce you to a man named Sir Simon de Ouse. I've got an engraving (sighs) here of him for you to look at. He's quite a dashing chap. Oh, Sir Simon de Ouse. Wow. But he was born in 1602, and he was most prominently known as a Member of Parliament for Sudbury in Suffolk. But through records on Farmer Past, we learn a great deal amount of who he was. We used diary entries already in this research. I don't know if you do or did ever keep one. I do not, to my great discredit. I must, I'm going to start. <laughs> well, Simmons kept three. And for a number of years, his writing was seen as one of the leading contemporary accounts of 1600s life. He's mentioned in the same breath as Samuel Pepys, even to the 20th century. He kept one in English, which related to the comings and goings of his works in Parliament. One in Latin, which related to the things he did outside of work, his hobbies and opinions and events of the day that he just didn't want everyone to read. And then a third diary in a cipher that he invented as a schoolboy, full of all of his innermost thoughts. And this is a real read. This is where we see self-conscious, egotistical, a little bit pompous, but he had a huge loyalty to his friends. He was brave. He kept true to his ideals and beliefs that were incredibly unpopular at the time. He wasn't entirely dismissive of Catholics at a point when it was very dangerous to be a Catholic. Uh, He had some Catholic friends, which he could differentiate between. And in that journal, we get one of the only surviving accounts of Stuart courtship. Simmons adored a lady called Jemima Waldegrave. He made numerous attempts to woo her, and he really did his best until she married another man, and he returned to his first love, which is books. Though it didn't take long until another caught his eye, your 10th great-grandmother, to which he wrote the following to her father. And it might be fitting again for you to read this aloud also. That's so spooky. So I'm reading out my ancestor's words. That's very cool. I excuse the subject matter of these lines, which is to implore your favour in vouchsafing me liberty to address the most zealous and earnest affection to your noble daughter that ever lodged in an honest heart. How can you say no to that? I have been extremely obliged to her honourable aunt, the Lady Wynne, who hath laid a foundation of hope and comfort for me, upon which I must beseech you to superstruct, assuring you that if my estate were tenfold more than it is, I should account it unworthy of her. That which it is, I shall gladly prostrate at her feet, and this, sir, I will be bold to say, whatsoever happiness the care, industry, and affection of a poor man may add to a deserving wife, I shall endeavour to procure to her. That's great! I love that! beautiful to see. And and we can see when he's knighted as well, a description that he's an antiquarian and collector of manuscripts. Some of the works that he transcribed no longer survive. So they make his writings the only source of some of these historical documents that exist now. 
and particularly his greatest work, which is a diary of parliament in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. But Simmons was one of those people who always seemed to be perched on the corner of every big event of the period. When the Duke of Buckingham, George Villiers, was assassinated in 1628, it was Simmons who advised him that he wasn't very well liked in England and he'd probably be wise to wear some chainmail or secret armour. And of course, that was ignored and he was stabbed to death very shortly afterwards by an angry soldier. Yeah, he was not a popular man. Okay, so some of his friends. So this is the article from a later article, but it's an account of Sir Simmons talking to him. Some of his friends said to Simmons and advised him how generally he was hated in England and how needful it would be for his greater safety to wear some coat of mail or some secret defensive armour. But the Duke sighing said, it needs not, there are no Roman spirits left. How well, funny. It's fantastic. And he lived through these really monumental periods in history, the English Civil Wars, and although he supported Parliament, he was dismissed in Pride's Purge of 1648, the only military coup in British history when soldiers barred the entry of all the MPs considered slightly hostile to the parliamentary cause. So he must have been a rather lukewarm supporter, maybe making his way as best as he could. That's amazing. I had no idea that I was related to him. That's a wonderful. Double ironic here, I think, because through more research, the records show that his granddaughter, your eighth great-grandmother, married the grandson of a man named George Coke who was the Bishop of Hereford at the time of this unrest. And he was one of 12 bishops who petitioned to dissolve Parliament entirely so that the King could put a stop to all of this nonsense. The rumours of civil war and was very firmly on the Royalist side. So George, being another of your 10th great-grandparents, even at the time a declared enemy of another of your 10th great-grandparents, shows quite well how two stories weave together and they make something new. Yeah, that's wonderful. I mean, I've often thought, I bet you David Lloyd George and the general in the First World War hated each other. If anyone's listening to this, I'd always love to find some evidence of them coming across each other. And and then imagine telling them that in a hundred years' time that their children would get married. It's just bizarre. It, it does show, you know, the world we shape is inherited by our children and they can make something completely new again. But we've still got those echoes of the past and they still run through our veins a little bit. And I wanted to then go back to Simmons for a second and say that he wasn't massively successful as a historian in his lifetime, but he actually made a far greater contribution to history than he ever could have dreamed of. So over 50 years after he died in 1704, a man named Robert Harley purchased his entire collection of books and manuscripts. And he'd acquired those over his lifetime. And Robert Harley founded a library. The Harleian collection became one of the founding principal collections of the institution that we all know and love, the source of a lot of the records that we're using today to tell this family story, the British Library. Yeah, definitely. The Harley Collection, that's right. So how cool. I didn't know the big chunk of the Harley Collection came from Simmons. That's so exciting. It's really good to see things come full circle, I think. And all the examples that we've explored today really illustrate that everyone has a story. And I could keep talking about all these different family members have equally fascinating lives. But with a website like Farmer Past, we can not only tell the story, but we can look into that world of ancestors. We can see the things that mattered. We can be inspired by the things that inspire them. We can ask ourselves what we do in the same situations and see those patterns that echo through the ages. And I think we can see something of ourselves in those ancestors, or more accurately, perhaps, something of them in us, because all their decisions shape that most exciting and inspiring history you'll ever pick up, which is your own family history. Well, I can't thank you enough, man. That really is very, very special indeed. I'd just encourage anyone listening to go and take all the tools that you've talked about because, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. You can't believe that your own ancestors are also going to appear in newspapers and magazines and things that will leave behind a footprint like this. It's wonderful. It really is more accessible than ever before. It's getting easier every day and it's just here waiting to be discovered. Using those censuses we've talked about and trying to work backwards from yourself, adding bits of your family story and maybe the stories that you have passed down or just using those historical records will mean that you too can find some great stories to pass on and keep with you at the same time. Mikko, thank you very much indeed, man. That was a huge treat. It's been my pleasure. I feel the hand of history on our shoulders. All this tradition of ours, our school history, our songs, this part of the history of our country, all were gone and finished.